Hi, um, I'm Amelia, and I'm going to be talking about poliomyelitis. So poliomyelitis is a virus. Um, it's also known as polio or infantile paralysis because when it was originally um, undiagnosed, when people couldn't figure out what it was, they found the most common symptoms of polio in infants. Um, the poliovirus is a part of the entovirus genus which is a part of the Picorna Verde family, um, which I'll get to in a little bit. The Picorna Verde family includes the positive single-stranded RNA. It's also a naked virus, so there's no envelope, and it has an icosahedral capsid. So as you can see in the image there, there is like tw uh, 20 equilateral faces on it. So it's pretty, it almost looks like a sphere. Okay, so going back to enteroviruses, these are characterized by having a fecal or oral route. So basically anyone who comes in contact with their mouth through with the feces or anything that hasn't come in contact with feces, contaminated feces. So um, that would include water or food or unsanitary conditions can lead to this. So a lot of kids playing at camp or something could lead to polio outbreaks. Um, so once the once polio gets into the person's mouth, it tends to grow in the throat and also in the intestines. This is where it proliferates for the most part. And so this is where you get the first form of polio, known as abortive polio. And it's like the mildest form, so it's kind of difficult to identify because it has a lot of flu-like symptoms, so nausea or headaches, um, so a lot of times it goes unnoticed and is misdiagnosed. Um, once polio proliferates in the um, mucus in the intestines, it can spread into the bloodstream, and basically from there it can get to the central nervous system, where it starts um, destroying motor neurons, which is what causes um, more of the paralytic polio um, that you normally see. Um, once it starts destroying the motor neurons, you, you get non-paralytic polio, which is a milder form of um, polio than the paralytic form because it basically like stiffens the muscles and makes them weak, but you're not entirely paralyzed yet. Whereas paralytic polio is where you get um, all the hallmark characteristics. Basically what happens is um, you lose the ability to move your arms and your legs and the rest of your body. So, like I said before, it enters the bloodstream and it attaches onto the motor neurons and inserts the RNA and where it replicates like profusely and then it destroys the cell. And from there it can like spread, which causes the inability to move your arms and legs. Um, bulbar polio is another form of polio. In, it's a very severe case, not many people get it, but basically what happens is that the polio virus attacks the brain stem and so what happens is that um, it, it, um, the muscles that are affected are the ones that are in the respiratory tract and the digestive tract, so it makes it really hard to swallow and to breathe, which is where you get the typical um, treatment for that would be like the iron lung, which I'll talk about in a second. Okay, so here's some images of the characteristics of polio, as you can see. There's a lot of young children that are often affected, and they can't move their arms and legs. And on the right image, you see the iron lung, which basically is like it increases and decreases the pressure so that you can breathe. So basically what happens is that you can't move your muscles in order to breathe, so they have to um, manually do it for you in this iron lung. So sometimes what happens is that after kids get polio, if they make a full recovery, they can get something known as post-polio syndrome, which basically means that around, they, it can be a range of like 15 to 40 years in which someone can develop post-polio syndrome. Um, but basically the, it's characterized by muscle so, uh, soreness and stiffness. And so you can't like move your muscles as efficiently. And so a lot of people are still on crutches even in later in life. 
but it only happens to about a quarter of the people who recover from polio, so it's not super common, but it still happens. Okay, so one good thing about polio is that it's being eradicated. So basically, there's only two countries in the world that still have polio, and it's Pakistan and Afghanistan currently. There are about 74 cases that they found in, in about like 2015. So that was about a year ago. So it's really good because this has gone down due thanks to the vaccine, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, the last outbreak in the US was back in 1952. And as you can see, those numbers there are pretty drastic. So around over 3,000 people died and 21,000 people were paralyzed, which is kind of a big deal. So um, thanks to the vaccine though, we were able to help bring it down a lot. And so it's on the verge of eradication right after smallpox. Okay, so back in 1955, during that outbreak in the U.S., they were searching for a way to prevent polio because you can't actually cure polio. So Dr. Jonas Salk was the one who discovered the um, IPV, which is inactivated polio vaccine, which is a killed or dead vaccine so it's like the polio virus but it's dead and so it can't actually harm you but when you inject it into your blood you will still get a um, you'll still produce antibodies basically so that your body can um, come up with an immune response the next time it comes encounter with it so um, thanks to this vaccine they were able to bring down um, the number of polio cases in the last naturally occurring case that they found in the U.S. was in 1979. Um, another polio vaccine that is used often in developing countries is the oral polio vaccine, but it's not used a lot in developed countries because it's a live virus, so you can actually get polio from this vaccine. Um, this was developed in 1961, and it kind of has like a dual purpose to it. Basically, it produces antibodies in the blood, which means that um, it the antibodies in your bloodstream will um, counteract any polio that it may come in contact with because then it stops it from uh, getting to the central nervous system so that you can't be paralyzed due to polio. It also creates local immunity in the intestines so that polio can't grow there because that's where it naturally will um, grow when someone is infected with polio. Um, but the downside is that it causes vaccine-associated paralytic polio, so you can still get polio from it, so that's why it's not used in developed countries very much. It's often used in developing countries because it's a lot easier to just orally give the vaccine to a lot of people. Uh, um, so that's why it's used in developing countries, and it hasn't been used in the U.S. since 2000. And um, one person that we all probably know um, who also had polio was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and um, he contracted this in 1921 at the age of 39. They think he got it at a camp because he liked to be outdoors, and so um, he was paralyzed for the rest of his life. And because of this, he was very um, active in trying to fight against polio. And so when the polio vaccine was created, he helped initiate the March of Dimes, so which is basically a way to um, raise money to help research against polio and to also um, administer the vaccine so that people could get it and not die from it anymore. So um, he was a big proponent in ending polio or helping to bring down the numbers of polio and hopefully one day can also lead to eradication. Okay, thanks.